have quite a few people here. We'll continue admitting people as they join. Um, but hello, everyone. My name is Antai Bilgatai, and I am the Senior Director of Development here at Everyday Democracy. I just want to say thank you for joining us, and thank you to all of you who are supporters of ours. We deeply appreciate all of you to help make our mission possible. Today is one of a series of our Join the Conversations, uh, which we host for our donors and supporters. Uh, so welcome today. We appreciate you, and we hope you get something out of this wonderful conversation. I would like to turn it over now to our moderator for the day, Gwen Whiting, who is our Director of Training and Leadership Development. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And it is so good to see so many faces in the place. Um, I see some familiar faces, and I see names that I have. I can now put a, a face to the name, and then welcome those of you who I have not met. We are in for um, an exciting panel today. Um, I either work with or have worked with all of the folks who are on the panel, and I am honored to be moderating this session today. Um, a little bit of background. We're going to be talking about the work that's in um, West Palm Beach, and a background around that is around the safety and justice challenge work that the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation has funded since 2015 to the tune of $300 million. They identified communities who were concerned around the issue of um, who's going into our jails and, and the disparities that we see around that, that um, is highly impacted with black and brown people. And they want us to, they wanted the communities to rethink how we do um, jailing. And so they identify communities and everyday democracy was one of the um, technical assistance providers because we do community engagement. And one of the things that uh, MacArthur realized is that you can't just um, fund these initiatives and have all the power brokers, perceived power brokers, such as judges and prosecutors and folks who impact who goes into those, those jails. But you need to have the folks who are most impacted involved as well. So those who are in the communities they should be at the table helping to make those decisions about how we rethink jailing. And so they did, decided let's do community engagement and everyday democracy was selected as one of the technical assistance providers. So we're gonna be talking about that today and we're gonna be talking about the pro approach that we have used in communities to help address what they're talking about as, as community engagement, what that looks like and how it has moved forward. So I'm gonna start by introducing Introducing the panel that we have, and um, Jamie Lee Bradshaw, and I don't know if we can have spotlight her. Um, there she is. Look at that. That's a friend of mine who I've worked with and known for a few years now. And so, Jamie, good to see you. So, Jamie is the Chief Strategic Officer with Community Partners of, of South Florida. And, and Jamie's um, community is one of those communities who received, received funding from um, the Safety and Justice Challenge and one of our communities that we work with. Then I want to end also with us um, is Barbara Cheeves. And Barbara will be assisting Jamie in terms of talking about the work. Barbara's been a senior associate with Everyday Democracy over time. And she has won many, many, many hats in West Palm Beach. So you'll be hearing her voice as well. So welcome, Barbara. Then we have Gwen Wright. And so you see, I have G-Lo next to my name because Gwen and I, we were in the same place. Place we are known as the Gwens, and I become Gilo, and she remains Gwen. So Gwen Wright, and she is Gwen is our project manager for the SJC um, initiative, where we are the technical assistance provider. And so she'll be speaking with that hat, and along on her team is uh, Sagacity Walker. So Sagacity. Sagacity is a program manager here at Everyday Democracy. And if you're calling in wanting to know more about Everyday Democracy or how we, you can do some of the work that we do, Sagacity is more than likely the voice that you will hear. So Sagacity, welcome. Um, did I get everybody? Seems like I had more people to introduce. So that was short and sweet. So we're gonna start. We're gonna start um, by having Jamie Lee share 
um, your experience in working in the Safety and Justice Challenge, being selected as one of the communities that's been funded, and having the technical assistance from Everyday Democracy. So Jamie Lee, if you would take it away. Thanks. And Barbara, I'm going to actually kick it to you because one of the hats that Barbara wore or continues to wear is she is the chair of the Community Engagement <laughs> Task Force for the Criminal Justice Commission. And they are the entity that received the funding from the uh, Safety and Justice Challenge. And, you know, I was an observer, a viewer of all of their hard work before I entered the scenario. And as an anchor partner for maybe going on six years or so, I thought that the next step and the next iteration to validating the voices we heard was to um, shrink the scope and have more intentional and private conversations. So Barbara, if you wanna intro and then I can jump in with the logistics of the actual dialogues. Sure, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I've been a member of the Palm Beach County Criminal Justice Commission, which you'll hear me call the CJC, uh, for the last 12 years. And for the last five or six, I have chaired the Community Engagement Task Force. And my co-chair is always a police chief. I've, I've had several different police chiefs as my co-chair, uh, because the whole point of Community Engagement Task Force was to give the community a chance to interact with law enforcement and to understand for, for, I, for each to understand the other better. So the work of the Safety and Justice Challenge automatically fell into the lap of the Community Engagement Task Force. Um, to keep it short, our Black elected officials in Palm Beach County came before our county commission right after the death of George Floyd, George Floyd with a letter asking them, what are our Palm Beach County police doing to be sure these things don't happen in Palm Beach County. Uh, we are run by a sheriff's department and 27 different police departments in our county. We're a very large county of 37 municipalities and 27 police departments. So our county administrator, Virginia Baker, wanted to see what we could do. And she turned to the CJC. And what we did was we created nine community engagement sessions. We went to nine different areas of our county and we invited police chiefs, uh, heads of sheriff's departments to meet the community. Uh, there was one caveat, we, this all started in during COVID. So where it would have been in person, they were mostly virtual. We had some in person, they were a hybrid. So people were able to ask questions through the chat, they folks that also invited to be in person. Out of that, it was decided that we should take those same communities because they had a lot of questions, a lot of mistrust, um, a lot of doubt as to the, whether or not the police and sheriffs meant it. And the next obvious step would be to run Dialogue to Change in those nine communities. And having run multiple Dialogue to Change at one time, I had never run more than six uh, concurrently. And when I heard nine, I started to just cry because I thought there was no way we could do nine. Uh, and how I could possibly oversee nine. So the, the easy segue was to go to community partners uh, because they are, I've been working hand in hand with them for the past 10 years and doing dialogue to change with them. Uh, and they're an anchor partner for, community, for everyday democracy. So it was a perfect partnership. Uh, the CJC had never been introduced to the concept before. So it was new to them, but it wasn't new to me or to community partners. So I'll go back to Jamie to say where she took over, thankfully. So yeah, I, again, we have been an anchor partner. And so what an anchor partner is, is that we are aligned. We are really seeking the same outcomes for communities that everyday democracy is. We are looking to bring voice to communities that have traditionally been voiceless and to share power. And so there's this whole rubric I remember going through, you know, are we aligned when it comes to the ideas around racial equity, around uh, resident leadership and resident voice? And that's how we became an anchor partner. Not that we had it perfect or we knew everything to do, but we committed to a journey together. And so we've been on this journey going on six years. As Barbara mentioned, the largest concurrent dialogues we did together was six. But I'm a techie person. I'm not too techie, but I'm kind of techie. So as soon as we learned it would be uh, during the times of COVID, I, I kept thinking this is possible with Zoom. We don't have to worry. So I didn't really look at it as a challenge. I looked at it as an opportunity 
to uh, decrease some of the barriers our families and our residents are usually facing, transportation, childcare, meals, and et cetera. And so if we created an opportunity for folks to come together from the comfort of their home, taking into account other barriers they might experience. So what we did is we piggybacked off all the hard work of Rosalind and Regina and Barbara and Ted White and all those folks who were doing those great conversations across the county. We took all the email addresses from those individuals <clears throat> and we asked them to do a survey. You listen to these, would you be interested in having a deeper conversation? Talk to us about what times and days are, are good for you. Let's talk about your technology access. And if you don't, thankfully we have a digital inclusion program at our organization. So we got funding to provide Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to individuals who needed them. And then we looked at our cadre of individuals who can facilitate these dialogues. Uh, and we realized that they were at a lot of different places. And so we did a refresher course on how are we going to convene passionate people who have expertise in different realms. So you heard that the CJC engages individuals from the system. So that's everywhere from law enforcement to courts, to judges, to Department of Juvenile Justice, all the way through. But we also know that the residents are as committed as individuals in the system. So we made sure that we did the best we could with the support from the CJC to pair residents with system representatives. And we made sure mostly across the board that it was even. <clears throat> so we took those nine communities that were presented in the first place and we filled them with passionate residents and committed service representatives. And we trained 36, some needed a refresher, but 36 individuals, Sagacity and Gwen, thank you so much, and Barbara, um, for that retraining refresh on facilitation 101, but then also on a guide that was developed just for Palm Beach County. So it was really special to have one with our data, our numbers to memorialize the challenges that we're facing right now. So we were able to provide that training and then we set everybody loose. We created nine Zoom accounts with nine sessions meeting on these days with parking lots of notes and session notes from every single one. And we had an amazing, amazing conversation. And I will say there were lots of challenges. <laughs> However, if we think about, again, reframing those challenges into opportunities, we learned where we could tighten up communication, where we could take better notes, where we could reach out to um, keep retention up. A lot of the times when you're having a dialogue, people are super amped for like the first two sessions and then life gets in the way, right? I've got to pick my kid up so I won't be able to. Well, we tried to really head that off by saying, so let's talk about it this time of day. Let's create a text group from all the participants. So the cops and the mom were on the same text group saying, don't forget, we need you here today. And we actually boasted an 83% retention rate through all nine communities with over 170 individuals, which is huge as a nation. I got some thank yous, some clappers. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't me, it was all the session leaders, the facilitators, and everyone who was committed to those conversations. So following the dialogue to change process, we culminated the dialogue process by having everyone develop actions, potential actions, because we realized that little subset of 15 to 35 people are, the, are just a tiny representative of their community. So we had them identify three potential goals that would have a positive impact on their neighborhood. And then we went to an action forum so we invited everybody back who was in those nine big conversations that the CJC had, everyone who were in dialogues. And of course we had to do it on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. for four hours on a Zoom. So everyone loved that. <laughs> but we actually did okay. We had 135 individuals and we broke up. What was really cool is everybody provided their testimony of them engaged in conversation. Then they presented the three potential actions per community. And then we broke them out into breakout rooms for those nine regions. And they got to ask questions of the dialogue participants. 
and then they voted. And so they used like a little survey monkey, sent them the link and they went ahead and did all that. And by the time we were able to get back together, we knew what nine actions our county would present to the CJC as tangible solutions to challenges that they talked about. And then came four months of action planning <laughs> with the same individual. So talking and deciding is great, but if you can't see a result of your efforts, then you look back at your time and it's like, what did we do? We just came up with great ideas. And so Barbara and myself had weekly sessions with nine groups all in the evening. And guess what? There are not nine days in the week, let me tell you. So that was really challenging. Uh, but we, we were a great tag team. And at the end of the day, we presented nine solutions that we're asking. And really, really point of success for us is we had a core partner who was aligned and as committed to get them done. So I knew my time as an anchor partner, as a consultant to facilitate the dialogues, to get to action, to take step one through three on that action. I knew that was finite, that time was finite. I needed to confirm that the Criminal Justice Commission, their Community Engagement Task Force was the sustainability partner. And from the beginning, I was always transparent and whoever is gonna do these dialogues has to be transparent. I'm here for a moment in time, but while I'm with you, here's what I hope to accomplish and lead, right? And then here's who's gonna pick up the reins and take you to successful completion. So again, lots of opportunities that you learn throughout the way, but tons and tons of success points. We had individuals who said, I never knew that law enforcement agencies or anybody else had any prevention. I thought all they did was lock them up. But because of their time together, they got to learn about all the prevention programs there were. We had people, tons of people with testimony. We had a, a high ranking officer <laughs> who literally was like, I'm only gonna come to one and came to every single one and presented at the action form. And that, and Barbara and I have known this person for almost a decade and <laughs> for that to come out was massive. Uh, and so just dig in, commit, find your sustainability partner and you'll reach the people you want um, is, kind of my big and then small view of this amazing effort. And again, I thank Everyday Democracy for being our partner and the CJC for allowing us to do this great work. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Barbara. Thank you for Hi. the good work that you all are doing. And I mean, it's just really exciting. And we, hopefully we're gonna get some questions and but we wanna hear from the other panelists as well. I also, in my Southern upbringing, I gotta show respect. We do have our executive director from Everyday Democracy on, Martha, Martha McCoy. And um, Gwen has a team, Gwen's gonna speak next. And as the, the project manager for the SJC initiative, um, but also on her team is Alex Cartagena, who's also on. So I want to give you a little respect there, Alex, as well. But Gwen, Gwen, can you step in and talk about where we enter and how we enter and what that has meant? With you and Sagacity, take it away. Absolutely. Uh, I'll start, uh, and then I'm definitely going to kick it to my colleague, uh, Sagacity. But I uh, just want to say thank you for the opportunity to share information about everyday democracy with those of you who are on, on the call. And uh, as Gilo has said, you know, in terms of how everyday democracy enters into a community, I just wanna spend a little time talking about that. Um, you heard different pieces that both Barbara and Jamie shared in terms of uh, the, the importance of um, including everyone in the, in the approach um, and uh, you heard them talk about the, the level of commitment and the time investment that's necessary. But I'd like for us to take just a step back for a moment to, to just really share with, with our friends and supporters how we got to this place. You've heard Palm Beach sort of talk about and share their story, but one has to understand that the everyday democracy story, right, our approach, started over 70 years ago, back in the 50s and 60s with our founder, um, Paul J. Eicher. And that gentleman who was a businessman 
had an almost an epiphany in a sense after being a part of a dialogue uh, presented by Ford around adult education. But it was there, something resonated with him about finding his voice and being able to own an issue in a way that was different from what he was uh, accustomed to. And so that was the nucleus of every day's sort of a, a start, if you will. And so from that and over the years, uh, through generous contribution, donation, the endowment, we've been afforded, the organization has been afforded to be a part of the Topsville Foundation who supports us, here we go now, right? Entering into communities to support their engagement efforts. And while the approach has particular pieces, um, we want to make sure that we are clear about the guiding principles of everyday democracy's approach. And so you, you heard again, uh, Jamie and Barbara talk about um, the discussion guide that was created uh, relevant to the concerns of their community, uh, the Palm Beach County. That's uh, sort of a given, that's a given for everyday approach. It's a part of everyday democracy's approach. And uh, along the continuum of that approach are principles to include being collaborative, working together, making sure that we're inclusive. You heard uh, them talk about um, a high ranking law enforcement official being a part of the small group dialogues. Well, at the other end of the spectrum was someone who was previously incarcerated, who also had an opportunity to sit room in room uh, across from each other and share and talk, learn and become aware. And so it's that sort of deep relational building, um, that sort of starting the approach with intentionality to uh, move towards outcomes. Those are found the foundation. Those, those uh, factors are the, are the foundation of everyday uh, democracy's approach, right? and then centered through equity. It's important for anyone that's taking on the approach, everyday democracy's approach of community engagement to understand that we encourage, we embrace them to look at the historical context of their community. What's the culture of your community and how does it impact the issue or the topic or the subject matter that you're wanting to see change around. And so we're, us working with Palm Beach County in a way that was very focused around reducing the disparities within the local jails, it, it, that work started with a very strong foundation. And it definitely is a thread that moves throughout all of the work that everyday democracy does. So I wanted to sort of pin and set the foundation for how we approach a community, including how we started our work with Palm Beach County. And I'd like for Sagacity to talk a little bit more about what did that look like entering into um, Palm Beach County? What were some of the organizing pieces that every day had to really share with that, um, as Barbara introduced, the CJCC, that coalition, that group of people who were dedicated and committed to seeing change around this issue. So I'll stop there and I'm gonna ask the sagacity to pick it up. All right, um, good day everyone. So when we first started, this was pre-COVID. So I actually visited down in Florida. So when we began, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. As someone who lives in Connecticut, I really enjoyed visiting down in Florida. Um, but as we did the work, I think a big piece of the work that we have to do in the uh, beginning is connecting with the CJC, connecting with the people who you know really have a say. So would it be police, the police department? I think we worked uh, talked to some folks from probation, folks who work in the prisons. I mean, in the jails, that type of thing, and making them aware of racial equity, what racial equity is. Um, doing an orientation with them down there, letting them know this is everyday democracy's process. We do community dialogues. This is how dialogues work. It's about bringing different people from the community together so they can collaborate on ideas. It's about sharing and collaborating with one another, those type of things. So I think that was a big piece of, of the work that we had to do in the front end. And um, 
usually when folks come to us, I call that, you know, the organizing phase where it's bring together a bunch of people who really want to move the work forward. We didn't have to, you know, struggle to recruit people onto that because we had Jamie Lee and Barbara down there and they were part of the CJC from the onset. So that really helped us hit the ground running where it was the group is already there. Now we just have to sort of bring them up to speed and let them know um, how we're going to be moving forward. But other than that, I mean, that was that was the big piece. And then, you know, doing the facilitator training for the local folks down there, again, um, to Jamie Lee and Barbara's credit to pulling those folks together. So that was a big piece of what we provided down there is making sure that the folks who were going to be doing that, what I call the heavy lifting and making and seeing these action ideas come to fruition later on, that they were aware that the process is not one of those things where we gather people together for one afternoon for an hour, then expect some sort of idea. No, this is a longer, um, this is this is a because this is a longer um, investment. So once they were understood that, that's when we were able to really open up the doors for dialogue. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Sagacity. And I see that there are some questions coming in the chat. Um, I know that you've answered some of them, Jamie Lee, but I'm not sure everybody's reading them. I know there's one question that you mentioned early on in terms of bringing people together around the dialogues. And the question is, did you use a curriculum to have those conversations or how did you start those discussions? So you and Barbara could address that. Sure. Um, and I'll just say I was uh, sending lots of things in the chat and my chat has failed and I don't want to leave the meeting so I can't type anymore. I think they're like, you're done, you're cut off. Um, so again, being an anchor partner for so many years and Barbara being a senior associate for so many years, uh, Ms. Gwen talked about that the discussion guides are core and perfect question, Richard. You're gathering all these people with very different insights let's call it that, uh, and you're having them produce something that is positive and helpful, but you can't just leave that up to chance. And so the discussion guides provide a roadmap to that conversation. And so I would never suggest you throw people with opposing views or maybe just aligned views in a room without a, a plan or a roadmap to have that conversation. Um, what was special about this project is that the funding came with a county slash issue specific guide. Usually they're, you know, pretty generic because they want individuals coming on the site to be able to pull it down, insert your own county data. This was meant and built for our county. So it was, it was very special and it made it easier for facilitators to just pick up, read, understand because it was personal to them and then move forward. So facilitators and I were very excited about the specificity of the discussion guide. So yes, uh, maybe Bar I know Barbara and Sagacity doggone wrote the whole thing so they can speak to its development, but in its implementation, it was amazing to have um, a specific one for us. Actually, I'll give that to Sagacity. I just read it, he wrote it. Uh, <laughs> I, I just we love read transparency. It. Um, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I just want to add, because there was a, uh, Martha asked me a question during this uh, in the chat, that was how the CJC was committed to the sustainability. And I think that's an important, important thing to answer. Mm -hmm. um, we were already, uh, the Community Engagement Task Force was alive well before the MacArthur grant arrived. You know, we were already there. You know, we were already working to try to build barriers. The first chief, who's no longer a chief here, Chief Mooney, um, actually was featured in an Everyday Democracy Guide years ago because she did Kids and Cops workshop mm -hmm. with her police officers and kids in this community. That was way before, um, you know, we're kind of a, we were a study circle city or a study circle county, you know, so it wasn't new to us. Um, so the, the uh, we were already committed to whatever we could do to bring down the disparities in the jail and to have better relationships between the police and the community in Palm Beach County. The MacArthur uh, grant was just a plus. You know, and having the technical assistance for everyday democracy, I was clicking my heels together because when we got that technical assistance, most people didn't even know what it meant. You know, and when I heard that we had that, I was like ecstatic because that really meant we could move this forward. Uh, and I just want to add something to what Jamie talked about real quickly. Um, actually, before I do that, 
because it's the work that we do tomorrow, our community engagement task force meets. And Gwen and Sagasti, I meant to send you an invitation and I forgot. <laughs> we meet tomorrow morning, actually, or tomorrow at noon. And these nine groups are going to present their items to the community engagement task force. Um, they've not seen them all. They've seen the list but they haven't seen the human beings that were behind it. So we're going to have them come because we have committed to taking these things forward. You know, as Jamie said, she had to get the commitment from us. We have committed. Some of them were almost complete because it was kind of a, I had a finite answer or a finite time. Some of them were going to take a little bit longer uh, and some may have to be tweaked quite a bit. And it didn't hurt, by the way, that because we had MacArthur funding, we were able to put some dollars into this. Each of those nine groups got five hundred dollars to do something with their um, with their project, and the facilitators got stipends. So I, I I don't want to make everybody think it was just like magic and that easy. We did have some dollars to work with, um, and the commitment and the relationship that Jamie and I already had. So how easy it was to work together. Of course, it meant a lot of screaming, yelling, and crying. That every every discussion wasn't easy, uh, but we knew one another well enough to make it happen. So I'll stop. I didn't know, Sagacity, if you want to speak to that, but there's also a question about the time frame in general. So um, could you also address the time frame from the organizing, the conversations and the action? And Jamie Lee, you could actually talk to that too in terms of what it actually, how long it actually took for you all to go through that whole piece. Uh, so for timing, this is, this is an interesting question, especially like I said, when I first started, we started this process before COVID. So we were ready to go, I think, because um, I was down there like in the February before COVID, we were gonna start that spring. And then everything, you know, COVID happened. So there was a long pause for about a close to a year or so, right? Um, so normally I would say that organizing phase could take, you know, up to six to nine months. Um, depending on your community connections and the network that you have in the area in which you live. Again, um, as I stated earlier, the fact that Barbara and Jamie Lee are very active down there in Palm Beach, they already had the folks and knew who to reach out to, et cetera. Sometimes we work with communities when people don't have that network. So what Everyday Democracy does is support them as they build that network and say, who are the people that you really need to connect to and bring to the table? So um, timing can vary. Uh, with this one, COVID is what made it, uh, what made it last, what sort of made it long, last so long in terms for us to get going. Um, but then once we got going again, it happened pretty quickly, right? Um, once the green light happened, I remember, was it early last year, like spring or so last year, we got back together and we did the trainings towards the end of the summer. And then you all did your dialogues, I think the end of the summer into early fall, and then the action form and whatnot and been chugging away at action. So it, it didn't take as long as it could have taken, but COVID was a big uh, issue. <laughs> and I forget, what was the uh, second half of that question? Um, I, I think you might have answered, we was asking about the timeline and I didn't know if Jamie Lee had anything to add to that. No, we okay. did it, uh, it was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. We have another question um, from Richard Frieda. Can you give a few examples of the actions and projects that came out of the initiative? I actually pulled it up um, and I have not shared the case study. So we actually did a marketing case study and a case study, Go AmeriCorps Vistas, which we have a graduate in the house, Carlin. Uh, we actually assigned a an AmeriCorps Vista to help us memorialize this process. And so in, uh, we've developed a final report for the CJC, which they have, and an appendix of every single note we took and attended sheet. Guess how big this is? 681 pages was the appendix. It's massive. So when we talk about how hard this work is, it's really, really labor intensive. So if I made it sound easy, it's not. Uh, but the case study is a, is a really nice quick read. It gives you a good overview without being present for six months. But I just pulled up the action plans and Barbara said it really well. Some of them were a point in time sort of thing. They were a conversation because what they deemed as having a positive impact on their neighborhood were activities and events that would bring system representatives closer with community, right? 
And then other communities went what we call BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goals. And they're like, we want to reform this system and we want to do this. So what we were very transparent in doing was setting expectations. So someone said they wanted to change the bail system. I don't want to crush your dreams, but we're not going to do that in three months, right? But what I will do is that we would create, uh, we would advocate for bail reform. And a, a couple others said that they wanted to bring mental health in alongside criminal justice. We, no, that's not going to happen right now. <laughs> we can't do that in three months. But what we can do is advocate and provide data and, and have continuing conversations with the CJC about a format where we can align mental health services with the criminal justice uh, system. Another one, another BHAG one was uh, our, we have, Palm Beach County is very interesting. 1.6 million people, 39 municipalities, you heard all that. We have urban, suburban, and completely rural. So in the rural community called the Glades, they have no re-entry program. Everyone that returns has to go to the coast, which is about an hour, to, to receive the level of services. And then people wonder, why recidivism and what's happening in the glades is happening is because I don't have that access. You're assuming I have car and transportation and what I need to do that. So they were advocating for this really big effort to bring a re-entry program to the glades. We can't do that in three months, but we can advocate for it. So as Barbara said, some of them were to have dinner with returning citizens and system providers so they understand what life was like and not just what the policy they wrote was. <laughs> and that was very eye-opening. Uh, and then other things were advocacy campaigns and setting the stage for the CJC to pick that up as a bigger initiative that will might take years, but at least they're a part of the solution now and not just the CJC coming down from the heavens saying, I believe this is what you want in your community. So that's a couple. Uh, if we figure out how to share this stuff, I can send it to the EVDEM team and they can send out all nine. Uh, of the actions. That's awesome. Uh, there was a question about the, the discussion guide that you all used and is that available to share? Are you willing to share that as well? And I see heads nodding. Jamie Lee, we know. have- I, I don't own it, so I'll leave okay. it. <laughs> okay, great. It's um, actually, it's, we look at it as yours, Gwen. So add it to, I mean, I've had the pleasure of getting a lot of study guides that other people have committed created in other municipalities for different work I've done through the years. So absolutely, uh, they could use the format and change the, the numbers to theirs. Okay, so we will make that happen. Thank you all. Uh, there was another question that came in terms of, um, and I wanted, I wanted to um, make this a dual question. Can you talk more about developing relationships and agreements with the sustaining partners how did they do the transition of getting into hosting supporting action? Um, for the sake of time, along with that, I wanted to also ask what challenges that came up for you that you were able to address them and um, turn it into something, an opportunity to move your program forward. And Gwen, I would love for you to speak to this as well, because not only were you working with West Palm, but as a TA provider, we're working with the folks um, that SJC first appointed to, to manage the funds that are going into the communities and to manage the communities as well. So any challenges that would be helpful to share here as well in, ter in terms of communities taking this on and moving it forward. So who would like to first talk about how you sustain those relationships and then when the challenges that you saw as a TA provider. I'll go with the sustained relationships piece, um, because as I said, they're presenting to us tomorrow. Um, the police chief that is my co-chair now is the most community-minded police chief we have in the county. So he's the perfect one uh, to work on this now, because he's, his comment at the last meeting was, we've got to stop talking and make some of these things happen. Um, you know, one of the examples I will give is what could be a challenge which could, we could turn around was a piece that Jamie mentioned about pairing mental health providers with law enforcement officers, what he's doing. Um, we do have one, our, our 
this is going to be recorded, right? Our largest law enforcement agency in the county has a little bit of pushback about that. It is not sure something they want to undertake, um, but it can happen. So uh, the opportunity there is to engage city commissioners because the city commissioners in each municipality pay for the services of that large green law enforcement agency. And so they can actually not insist or encourage them to follow the leads of people in other communities like Delray Beach, which is where my, my co-chair is from. Uh, so that's an example of one other one um, was the, Jimmy mentioned the um, returning citizens having dinner with um, systems partners. And I'll use one great example. Uh, our public defender's office is told that they're, they're their attorney is supposed to see a, a, a an arrested citizen, arrested prisoner within 24 hours. She learned that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. You know, so to have the people who we asked them what their experience was from the time the cuffs went on to the time they went to either trial or permanent incarceration, and you could see the system partners, the state attorney, the public defender, the reentry people, kind of gasping. And we learned that one of the breakdowns was people, while services are out there, there's no access to services. Mm -hmm. So people are coming out of the jail having no idea what's available. And the first person they meet is somebody who can take them right back into where they came from, as opposed to somebody who can take them forward to success and not no recidivism. So the opportunity to break down some of those barriers and I'll, one last one, people, one of, the, one of the biggest reasons people are sitting in jail, our Palm Beach County local jail, is failure to appear. Mm -hmm. They're not showing up for court dates. Why aren't they showing up? Transportation, um, communication, childcare, you name it. We have developed a card. One of the groups, one of the, one of the nine groups developed a card with who to call if you, once you get even a, a summons. Mm -hmm. You know, is it the clerk of court? Is it the public defender? Is it the state? Who should you call? And it's, it's being created in three languages. And we have one very willing person from that big green department who's willing to try it in his, in his um, what do you call it? Where he patrols, his district. Uh, and that district happens to be those Western communities that very, very uh, undisconnected communities. So that can give them a really good opportunity. So those are some really concrete things that I think we got in some real, real relationship changes. The only other thing I would say is, even though I was tapped as the consultant to help implement, we had a guiding committee. And that guiding committee was comprised of the sustainability partner. So when Sagacity is talking about looking at a county and identifying who needs to be at the table, whoever is identified for whatever role, we were there as the consulting implementers, Gwen and Sagacity were there as the TA, Barbara was there as supporting the consultant, but also in her role as the CJC, and both individuals representing the CJC were there. So, and we met weekly, every Friday at three o'clock. Uh, so, you know, throughout the process, everybody was committed because they knew what was going on, the highs, the lows, the challenges, weekly updates were provided to, to when we met. So I don't think you just tap a sustainability partner and you're like, we'll be back in six weeks. No, they need to be invested from the beginning and throughout the process. Mm -hmm. And, um I really appreciate all the questions that are coming in. I'm trying to get to them. Gwen, I don't know if you wanted to add something right now. And, and then um, while, while we bring Gwen on, can you, um, Jamie, think about were there any policy changes as a result of this work? Okay, Gwen. So very quickly, G, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. One is a lot, of, I think a lot of the questions um, that's being asked, um, really would be covered um, in, in terms of understanding or a deeper understanding of everyday's approach that's that's really that really takes place takes place in three phases. And during that first phase, which we call organizing, so much rich information is given and shared and learned that during that phase, we actually talk about, creating that sustainability partner um, in terms of the language that Jamie is using, and then the coalition or the committee that Sagacity uh, spoke to. 
So it's all during that phase where we go deep in those issues about building up the infrastructure that's needed for the success of the approach. Also in that um, organizing phase, we really do go deep about understanding uh, or creating a shared language around understanding racism, um, the impact that discrimination has had on that community. What does that mean and how is it sort of showing up now in terms of the issue at hand? So I just wanted to say that um, the totality of everyday's approach is very inclusive of some of the particular pieces that folks are, are, are inquiring about. Uh, Martha asked us to speak to sort of the understanding of racial equity and the impact of racism. That's all sort of dealt with, um, it's throughout, throughout the approach that, that, that those concerns are discussed and learned from. But that initial sort of understanding about the impact of racism and discrimination and, and where racial equity fits into that, it's often taken care of or addressed in that organizing phase with those um, members who have agreed to be part of the long-term coalition, committee, commission, whatever the label is, to see this work through. So I just wanted to speak to that, G, and then I know you had some other questions that you wanted addressed. Thank you, Gwen. Oh. Jamie Lee? Okay. You were going to talk about... No, oh, you, had, you could go ahead and go first. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, so, so far, the question about policy changes, the only thing that I think is going to is going to be instituted quickly is that I-card that Barbara was talking about. Uh, we are working on the pilot right now to get that card printed, to get it in the hands of that district, which sounds like one district, but it's huge. <laughs> it's like land mass, it's insane, and the number of uh, deputies that would have to carry it is a lot. The CJC is committed to evaluation as well. They're not going to come down and just say, let's just do it across 1.6 million people. They want to test it in that district. They want to see if it's uh, going to take and if it's going to have an impact on the decrease in failure to appears. And then if that is, then we have the data necessary to get the funding to create the card to then have everyone give it out in perpetuity. So that's one policy change. The other ones are the advocacy those. Those are going to take a long time. And <clears throat> while we want to be able to speak quickly to policy change and quickly to action, show me a policy that happened pretty quickly. <laughs> There's not many, especially with these big systems that you're able to say, we got our residents together and they wanted this and now we can do that. Uh, it takes time because we have some systems who are very committed to doing business as usual. And they need a lot of evidence that changing the process is beneficial. And so lots of advocating, lots of data collection, lots of negotiations, pilots, evaluation of the pilot would need. But my prayer is that all nine have, number one, a positive impact, uh, as well as lives on in some sort of perpetuity. It may not always be a policy change, but maybe it's an annual conversation where system providers are sitting down and breaking bread with individuals who have been involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, that, that, for me, would be amazing. Um, really quickly, I did want to, um, when we were talking about the planning committee and the calls that we were having weekly, right, I did notice Rosalind was on here, so I did want to shout out Rosalind. Thank you for all your work. And um, I also mentioned something about the racial equity piece, right? So there's the organizing where we do make folks aware of racial equity, structural racism, how it's appeared throughout our history, et cetera. But then even the facilitators who are facilitating the dialogue circles, we're making sure that they're introducing racial equity into how they facilitate, right? Um, if you have, uh, say, a white woman physical facilitating with a black woman, right? You don't give all the power in as a facilitator to the white woman because now we are um, continuing sort of uh, the racial hierarchy that we've been raised with, right? So we are making folks very aware of racial dynamics, how they come into play in ways that we don't even necessarily imagine until they actually um, have a negative effect on folks. So we're very mindful of that. And then also in the action piece, and I loved what Jamie Lee did in terms of 
Um, the action ideas, there were, you know, people use SMART goals, where Jamie added the SMARTY goals, which is the traditional SMART goals in terms of specific, um, you know, uh, measurable, et cetera, but then having I as in inclusive and E as in equitable, right? So making sure that whatever you want to do, you're also including inclusivity and equity in that. So that's how one of the ways that some of the ways racial equity is infused into our entire process. Great, um, great comments. There's another question that came in. In the dialogue to change work, one of the things we know is that we can't get everybody in those community circles, but we certainly want the community to know what is going on because it, there are different entry points that people can come into that dialogue to change approach. So the question is, how have you kept the greater community informed about your progress? Uh, I would love to respond in text too, but I can't. God knows he doesn't make mistakes, right? He knows I shouldn't be chatting. Um, <clears throat> so first off, there were, I don't even know how many hundreds of people who either attended or um, at least registered for those bigger community conversations. So that was the first group of people we wanted to make sure were consistently on our email delivery chart. Then we added those notable individuals, which are commissioners that we need to make sure they know everything that's going on. And then we layered on top of that, every single individual from the system that was identified. They consistently got emails, not even just throughout the dialogue process, but even if they did not engage in the action part, they still got emails every single week uh, with progress towards the completion of the action. Um, whether they wanted the email or not, they could opt out, but they got it. So there was no doubt that their efforts and dialogue were happening. As an organization, we are an anchor partner. So we put social media out on our Facebook page. We encouraged everybody to share. Uh, and then again, the action form was welcome to anyone. So we used tons of one pagers, flyers, come on out. Uh, but we really tried to get back to who are your networks? So everyone in a dialogue, tell someone. Everyone in an action, tell someone. All your commissioners, make sure your constituents know. System providers, if you know this passionate peer or family member, tell them. Uh, so that's how we kept the general public informed. Thank you, thank you much. Um, I know that Jamie Lee talked about which, how change happened and Gwen, you put in the chat the, the approach and the levels of change. Can you say a little bit more about that, those levels of change in the dialogue to change approach? Sure, G. Um, pretty quickly, again, just sort of re-emphasizing that everyday, and that's what I call everyday democracy, right? Everyday's approach um, really looks at levels of change. And so, when we talk about uh, increasing awareness, organizing, helping people to really wrap their minds around uh, authentic community engagement, which is very, very detailed, uh, time commitment and this level of in, in, um, focused intentionality around locating and recruiting the voices to be a part of this. And so what happens is when those individuals agree from the leadership piece on down, from the, the I, I love Jamie's um, uh, description around the sustainability partners or the organizing partners. When those minds meet and say, this is what we want to do, commit to the long game around engaging community so that it's not just an event or a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, a one-time kind of activity but it becomes the way a community does its business. Community engagement is an operational piece of how decisions are made, how actions are resulted um, coming out of dialogue. So individuals that come into uh, wanting to participate in the conversations, they come in one way, I'm not preaching here, and then they leave another way at the end of the dialogue, right? And so that's that individual change. Relationships are built. Again, very diverse relationships. 
become working partners. That leads to taking it back to their organizations. Most of the time, those folks who are in the committees, the organizing groups, they're at some level of leadership within their organizations. And so that new or that sort of new awareness that they have experienced on the individual level becomes part of the organizational level. It starts to permeate the how they do their work in the roles that they have uh, sort of identified professionally with. That then lends itself to being in a position to create legislation or policy or outcomes that's on a broader, a more societal level. And so again, when I think my teammates talked about being in this level of commitment around authentic community engagement for the long haul, for sustainability, it, it's all wrapped into looking and expecting uh, results at each level where change can happen. Um, and so that's sort of a quick summation of those levels of change. And I must say, amen, Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are um, almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask quickly for a closing remark from Jamie and Sagasti and Barbara. Gwen just gave her a trial sermon. And then we're going to turn it over to Antai. Quickly, uh, amazing opportunity and look to have many more. Thank you. Yeah, I, I second that. It was um, it, it's uh, it was a proud moment. The uh, the action forum, while we thought we'd be in person with hundreds of people in the convention center, uh, being on Zoom with a hundred plus people on a Saturday morning for three hours was still pretty special. Uh, and I'll be very excited tomorrow to hear it presented to our community engagement task force. So it's over for some people on this call. It ain't over for me yet. I'm going to be living with these nine groups for a while. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Sagacity? Uh, so if anything, I do want to thank the folks who really laid the groundwork for doing this, right? Thank you, Jamie Lee and Barbara, for all the work that you down that, do down there. And then uh, to Gwen Wright, as well as um, Alex Cartagena, who's on this call, for the other work, that, the other cities that they were working with on the MacArthur Foundation grant, because some of the work that they did we used as, you know, inspiration for the discussion guide we used for Palm Beach, things like that, right? Um, the way everyday democracy communicates and collaborates with one another. So nothing happened all on its own. It was a lot of different moving pieces, folks sharing information and, um, you know, being ready and willing to do the heavy lifting. So thank you to all my folks who helped us with this. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Appreciate you. And I'm going to turn it back to Antai. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you, panelists. This was a really rich and wonderful discussion and such an exciting project. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, for those of you on the call, I wanted to let you know about an upcoming uh, event that we are a co-partner on that might be up your alley as well. On March 9th, we are partnering with the Mark Twain House here in Hartford, as well as Community Partners in Action on a virtual event. Um, it'll be a conversation with Kristen Henning. She's the author of a book called The Rage of Innocence, How America criminalizes black youth. Uh, it's a free event, but advanced registration is required. And uh, our colleague Jenny will be popping the link for that event into the chat, there it is. And uh, we hope you'll join us for that as well. And we'll also be hosting future events like this. Hope we'll see you at future ones. If you have follow-up comments or questions, I believe all of you have my email, feel free to direct those questions to me and I will channel them out to our panelists. And like I said, in the chat, we will be sending out a link to a recording of this conversation, along with some of the materials that Jamie and Gwen highlighted uh, so that you can do a little deeper dive into this project. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>